Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's second webinar in this three-part series called Borderlands, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Shelfont, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. Our museum is a tremendous resource for the community, and so much of it can be accessed online. Beyond these webinar programs, the Yellowstone Gateway Museum also offers a fascinating digital photo archives, online exhibits, and research services. So if you're not currently a member, we really encourage you to become a member and explore more about the rich natural and cultural heritage of Park County, Montana. In a moment, I'll introduce the museum's curator, Karen Reinhart, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter, Mary Murphy. Your questions will be anonymous. To submit a question, just type your question in the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel, and Karen and I will read the questions and share them with our speaker. As time allows, Mary will address as many questions as she can both during and after the presentation. We will be recording the webinar and we'll upload it to Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And then finally, following the webinar, you'll have an opportunity to take a very brief survey. And we hope you will take that survey because it'll help us to continue to improve this webinar series and other programs of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. I'd now like to introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhart. Karen? Thank you, Diane, and thank you for all of your help. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I invite all of you to register for the final Borderlands program. On number, November 17, so next week, next Wednesday, John Axline presents the Beartooth Highway, a history of Montana's most beautiful drive, a story of how the highway came about and the story of the men who designed and built America's most scenic highway. We really hope that you'll join us. Tonight's speaker is Mary Murphy a distinguished professor of history at Montana State University Bozeman and the director of the Ivan Doig Center for the Study of the Lands and Peoples of the North American West. Mary grew up in Massachusetts, did her graduate work at the University of North Carolina and came to Butte in 1979 to do an oral history project on mining. That's when she was first introduced to Ivan Doig and this house of sky. Mary was the director of the Butte Silverbow Archives while writing her dissertation on Butte. She taught a year at the University of Wyoming and started work at MSU in 1990. She was co-director of the Center for Western Lands and People, Peoples when MSU acquired the Doig Papers and when the center was renamed for the Ivan Doig Center. Mary became director last year. She teaches courses in American history with a special focus on gender, and on the history and culture of food. Among her books are Hope in Hard Times, New Deal Photographs of Montana, 1936 to 1942, and Mining Cultures, Men, Women, and Leisure in Butte, 1914 to 1941. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. And please welcome Mary Murphy. Okay, <clears throat> whoops. All right, have you switched over to me? Okay, yes. great, because I can see you, Karen. Um, I am so pleased to be here. I wanna thank Karen and Diane, Karen for inviting me and Diane for helping us do a practice session with the technology. So I want to um, share my screen with you. And then at the end, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause throughout to see if you've asked any questions so we could have a little sort of intermission from just me talking without any feedback. And then hopefully we'll also have some time for questions at the end. And what I wanna do tonight is talk some about Ivan Doig's biography and um, about this house of sky and about how he writes about working people. And then I wanna tell you a little bit about the Ivan Doig archives, which we have here at the university. So let me um, share my screen. Okay. Karen, can you tell me if you can, everybody can see the slides? 
Yes, I, it looks good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't see the Q and A or have any way to know what people are thinking. You're going to have to. That's relate. okay. We'll, okay. we'll handle that part. Okay. So great. Um, so uh, as Karen mentioned, for those of you who haven't listened to the first uh, talk in this series, the theme is borderlands. And so I had to laugh a little bit when she called and asked me to talk to Ivan Doig and to think about borders, because of course, the border is just one county line between Park County and Mar County, uh, where a lot of Ivan's um, youth took place. So if you look at this county map, and you see Mar County there, uh, just north of Gallatin and Park. And if I knew how to do this with that slide, I could have drawn an arc heading kind of northwest up toward Glacier. And it's really in that territory between Mar County and Glacier County that Ivan Doig spent his childhood and his teen years, his kind of coming of age before he left for college and then really never returned to live permanently in Montana. Um, there must have been something in the water supply in Mar County that turned out riders because although Ivan Doig is the best known of the Montana riders to come out of, Cass of Mar County, um, you all also might be familiar with Grace Stone Coates, who was a poet, um, and then Taylor and Rose Gordon, who were um, members of the only African American community in White Sulphur Springs. And Taylor, went on to become a very well-known singer during the Harlem Renaissance. And he wrote his own uh, story, his autobiography called Born to Be. And Rose Gordon wrote for the Mar County uh, newspaper. And there's an interesting little reference in the, um, toward the end of This House of Sky when Ivan is trying to tell his grandmother what it means to be an editorial writer. He had been hired to write um, editorials for a magazine. And she said, oh, you mean like the pieces that Rose Gordon writes in the county newspaper? Um, and I'm happy to tell you that uh, there is a person who has written a biography of Taylor Gordon that was published a couple of years ago. And he has now finished a biography of Rose Gordon. So you're just going to have a lot of really great information about Mar County writers. But as I was thinking about Karen's theme of borderlands, I realized how many borders Ivan crossed geographically, um, both within Montana and then when he headed to the Midwest to go to college and when he settled in Seattle, but also intellectually and in literary terms. And I'll talk more about that as we um, go along. Ivan Doig really opened up the land and people of Montana to a national readership. Indeed, we can thank Ivan for introducing many people to Montana, some of whom have even relocated here uh, after reading his books and have had a great influence on the state and um, on Mark County. One who many of you might know if you're uh, local is Sarah Calhoun, the founder of the Red Ants Pants Company, um, which makes work clothing for women and the founder of the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. And she moved to White Sulphur Springs after reading This House of Sky. And one of her uh, great wishes was to get to meet Ivan and she did get to meet Ivan and, Carol. They had been a little bit skeptical about her efforts to sort of um, support a, a, what we might call a rural revival in White Silver Springs and Mar County, but her am amazing work ethic and what she's accomplished really impressed Ivan. So I suspect that many of you have read uh, several of Ivan's books. Um, many, some of you might have known Ivan um, and other members of his family. Um, I think probably the book that is best known and that I'll uh, focus on because it is the one, one of the ones that in Mark County is uh, his memoir, This House of Sky. But just, uh, this is a, um, the uh, librarian who is really in charge of the Ivan Doig archives here at MSU put together this great little Ivan Doig in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to go through, talk a little bit more about some of these events, but he was born in White Sulphur Springs 
uh, just at the end of the Great Depression. He was a third generation Montanan of Scottish descent, and he was very proud of his Scots background. Um, several members of the Doig family had emigrated to the United States in the late 19th century and had come to Montana, took up claims, uh, worked in um, and around Ringling. And so Ivan was always very proud of that heritage. And he visited Scotland and tried to do a lot of his own family history as well. For those of you who have read many of his books, you know that a lot of his characters have a Scots background. And he even created a area called Scotch Heaven that was the setting for um, the trilogy that he wrote. He attended Valier High School. He then got um, degrees in journalism at Northwestern University in 1969. He got a PhD in history at the University of Washington. And his total production, uh, 16 books, two memoirs, of those two are memoirs and 14 are novels. Um, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma um, and he wrote actually the, his last four books after he was given that diagnosis. And then he died in April um, of 2015 in Seattle. So here, let's look a little bit at his um, family. Ivan was the only child of Charlie Doig and Bernetta Ringer. Uh, and as I said, several members of the Doig family had come from Scotland and uh, there were many members of the Ringer family also in Mar County. So he grew up with cousins, um, uncles, uh, his grandmother, who will be a really important part of this story. But, um, Ivan's parents never owned land. So Charlie Doig was a top hand on ranchers and he often was hired or made an arrangement with ranch owners to basically run the ranch on shares. That is once the sheep were sold, he would get a share of that profit. Bernetta worked with him sometimes as a cook, but oftentimes you know, working with the sheep, doing whatever kind of work was necessary. And so they were really, in some ways, itinerant workers, although not over a huge territory within, you know, this band of counties in Montana. And that, I think, you know, to pursue this um, theme of borders, really, we could say that's what started um, Ivan's rambling and his uh, crossing of borders and making many homes. So they moved quite a bit from job to job. Uh, and here's a great picture of Charlie and Ivan when Ivan was uh, small. One of the key um, moments in Ivan's life was when his mother died on his sixth birthday in 1945. She had suffered for asthma on, uh, from asthma over the course of her short life. And they, the family was working at a summer sheep camp in the Bridger Mountains um, here just to my east. And um, there she had a final asthma attack and died. They had spent the previous winter, and here's Brunetta and Ivan, um, they had gone to Arizona that previous winter to see if the dry southern heat would help uh, Bernetta's lungs, and they had liked it. But Charlie had made an agreement to run a thousand sheep on shares the next summer back in Montana, and he was not going to go back on his word. So, as Ivan wrote, and this is from This House of Sky, he said, We came back to Montana and rode the high trail into the Bridger Range one to her last hard breaths ever, and the other two of us to the bruised time after her death. So Charlie is grieving and he has a six-year-old boy and he moves uh, them to White Sulphur Springs where um, Ivan entered school. And when Ivan didn't have a babysitter or um, somebody to stay with. He accompanied Charlie to the nine downtown bars of White Sulphur Springs, which functioned not only as places to socialize and to drink, but also where ranchers would hire 
workers where they would hide. So it was like a, an informal employment agency. Um, for many people who have read This House of Sky, I've in several page descriptions of the character of each of these bars is their favorite part of the book. It's really interesting. Um, so I actually would encourage you to put in the q and A. I I would be very um, interested once we uh, have a pause of how many of you have read This House of Sky, how many of you have a favorite book of Ivan's that you might want to tell us. And we can, Diane and Karen can maybe do a little bit of a tally and we can come back to that um, in a little bit. So Ivan had a, you know, I'll talk a, li and a little bit more after I get past his um, biography, just such a way with words and his descriptions, people often praise his descriptions of the landscape and the language that he uses, his ear for dialogue, but he also has a great talent for describing architecture and describing these bars and street scenes. There's a wonderful, uh, very vivid description in this house of sky of a lambing shed that you can just, you can, you can smell it, you can feel it. He just had such a great uh, sense of creating a place for people. So at one point when Charlie's having a hard time hitting a rough patch, holding the family together, um, he invites Bernetta's mother, Bessie Ringer to come and live with, with them. And this was a hard decision on his part. He and Bessie were both very strong-willed people. They um, had not always agreed, but what bound them together was their love for Ivan. And um, so from then on, Charlie, Bessie, and Ivan form a new kind of relationship. And near the end of this House of Sky, um, Ivan writes, um, and I should preface this by saying, Ivan always said that this book, that this House of Sky was about memory, right? It, that it, it's called a memoir of his life, but it was, he didn't just sit down and sort of write from what he remembered. He also came back to White Sulphur Springs and he interviewed, he, he was able to interview his father one time before he died. He interviewed his grandmother many times. He talked to other people in Ringling and White Sulphur Springs and Dupuyer um, to get their stories. So he was both entranced by memory, which, you know, by the time he's writing this book, he has a doctorate in history, and we're all about accessing the past. But he also was skeptical of the reliability of memory alone. So he, all of his books are based on both memory and then deep, deep research. So this is a passage that he has to say toward the end of the book about um, this new complicated family. He said, memory is a kind of homesickness. And like homesickness, it falls short of the actualities on almost every count. I wait for the language of memory to come onto the exact tones of how the three of us across our three generations and our separations of personality became something both more and less than a family and different from anything sheathed in any of the other phrases, uh, phrases of kinship. So he thought a lot about this um, triangle of his grandmother, his father, and himself. And this is a great photo of him. I think this is when he got his doctorate and uh, Charlie and Bessie came out to Seattle. You can sort of tell that we don't have that kind of foliage in Montana. Um, so let me leave that up for a little bit while I talk about Ivan as a teenager. So when Ivan was in his teens, he took a job, or Charlie took a job to run a sheep, to run sheep on a ranch near Dupuyer. Um, this is beautiful country up on the front range of the Rocky Mountains. The place where the family lived was 
too far to go back and forth to school each day. So Bessie looked for a place for Ivan to board. And she didn't have any luck asking around. And she went into a cafe and um, asked the woman there. And she said, no, I don't know of anybody. And Bessie, um, according to Ivan's um, information, looked at the woman, Mrs. Chadwick, and said, well, how about you? And so Ivan went to live with uh, Mrs. Chadwick throughout uh, his high school years. So he boarded with this cafe owner. He went to high school in, in Valier. And then in the summers, he worked with um, Bessie and Charlie and the sheep. To me, one of the most powerful passages in this house of sky is this storm that comes up one summer day when they are tending the sheep on a lease, um, a lease up in the Blackfeet Reservation. And this is where Ivan has this epiphany about his future. So he tells the story over the course of several pages, and I'm, I'm going to abbreviate it here. But he said the sheep had been shorn in early July. And as he wrote, within a week, the sheep would be gray and hardy again, their next fat round sponge of fleece already beginning to cloak them. But for these first few days, these first days after the shearing, they stood, as he said, naked, helpless to a storm. And two days after that shearing, a cold, hard, rainstorm hit them. Ivan, his father, um, and his grandmother all tried to run the sheep into the shelter of a coulee, but it was a nightmare. And it's uh, just so dramatically told by Ivan in the memoir. Um, and he writes toward the end of this passage, a hundred or more carcasses spotted the prairie behind us. Dozens more strewed the base of the cliffs. If this was victory, and we had to tell ourselves it was, for we could have lost nearly all the sheep, I knew I wanted no part of any worse day. As much as at any one instant in my life, I can say, here I was turned. So he had this, you know, moment in which he knew that he was not going to follow the family into any kind of ranch work. And he said in an interview later, this is a, uh, directly in the book, he said he went back to school, he dropped out of the future farmers of America, he stopped taking any classes that would pertain to agriculture, and he took Latin and other courses that he thought would prepare him for a different future. At this point, he didn't know what that future would be. He just knew what he didn't want it to be. He didn't want to be taking care of uh, sheep and watching them be prey to the elements. So at Valier High, he had an English teacher, Mrs. Tidyman, who recognized his talents and encouraged him to apply for college, which was something that very few uh, young people in rural Montana did at this time. So he did, he wrote to colleges all over and he got a full scholarship for Northwestern University and he left uh, Montana for college in the fall of 1957. So it was there that he um, embraced journalism and it was there that he met Carol Doig who is a uh, the woman closest to you on the slide, and there's Ivan laughing. And she was another journalism student from the East Coast. Um, the two just found that they had a great deal in common, and they married in 1965. They stayed in the um, Midwest for a while. They both got jobs working on magazines, but Ivan, decided that he wanted to go to graduate school and they um, and he was missing the West and Carol who had visited in Montana had been had kind of fallen in love with the mountains and the western landscape and so she said well let's do it so they moved to Seattle and Ivan uh, got his doctorate in history at the University of Washington. He had planned to get that as a background to teaching journalism but um, 
you know, as many people do, they, he discovered while he was in graduate school that he just didn't really have a taste for academic life. And um, so he worked as a freelance journalist. And over this period of time, Carol got a job as a professor at uh, Shoreline Community College where she taught journalism and um, English. So Ivan, as Carol tells it, had wanted to write about his father. And he then said in an interview, and we have all, of, we have many interviews with him here at MSU in the archives. He said, if he wrote about his father, then he had to write about his grandmother. And if he was writing about his grandmother, he would have to write about himself. So he had not initially seen this as his, a memoir of himself, but um, of course their lives were so intertwined. And so from that became, um, came his determination to write This House of Sky, which was published in 1978 and um, has become, I would say, a very beloved piece of American literature, not just Western literature. Um, it was a finalist for the National Book Award in 1979. And remember, at the time that Ivan wrote this, he was only 39 years old. So to write a memoir at the age of 39 and for it to be so powerful and so successful, um, one of the people who has really sort of assessed Ivan's literature said it was a real, um, it was a, a significant marker in the, the genre of writing um, um, memoirs. Okay, so let me look here. This is one of the last portraits of Ivan. And I think that we, you know, just in this handful of photos that I'm showing you, and we have hundreds of photos in the archive, he, he had a great sense of humor, but he was a very, very serious man in terms of his writing. He wrote another memoir about his mother. He had um, found a series of letters that she wrote to her brother when they were in Arizona. And then, as I said, he wrote the 14 um, novels. When he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, Carol recalled his response to that diagnosis was to keep working and to work faster. She said he never gave up. And um, one of his dear friends, a writer uh, named David Laskin, would um, come to the hospital. Ivan was working on his last book and he couldn't uh, hold the pages, he couldn't edit the way that he had always edited his own work. And so David would read the pages to him and Ivan would say, I want you to change this. And he was doing that up to the day before he died. So, um, I mean, when we talk about a work ethic, there are few people that could beat Ivan Doig. And his legacy continues. Here's a slide of all of the covers of um, his books. When I became involved with the Doig Center and um, I put that tagline on my email, people I'd known for years came out of the woodwork to tell me how much they loved Ivan's books or that they had um, been on vacation in Montana and they made a pilgrimage to White Silver Springs or to Dubuyer. Um, and uh, I'm working on this other little project with a, a person who had um, lived in Montana and she now lives in Southern California. And she said, oh, I introduced Ivan Doig to my California book club and now we're all Ivan Doig fans. So, you know, Ivan did not like to be thought of as a Western writer. He thought regional writers were not taken as seriously and he wanted his books, although set in the West, to be about a larger life, that people anywhere in the country could relate to the themes and the characters and the problems uh, that they faced. So I wanna stop here and see if we have any questions that we might wanna take before I go on to talk a little bit about Ivan as a writer of work. Mostly what we're seeing in the Q&A, Mary, are comments about the books that people have read. Oh, great. Um, and I've kind of summarized that. Um, people have either read or their favorite books. Um, the top would be House of Sky, 
seven people mentioned that book. Uh, Last mm -hmm. Bus to Wisdom, uh, three mentions of that one, but I might also add that's one of my favorites. And <laughs> Ride With Me, Mariah Montana, a couple of mentions, mm -hmm. Whistling Season, and Dancing at the Rascal Fair. Um, Diane, did you see any questions? I did not really see um, questions. I didn't see other questions, but there was a comment and someone said, actually, it was the letters from his grandmother that were so touching, so loving, so like the letters I myself received from my family. That was really Oh, yeah, yeah, that's lovely. And he does include those letters, it's some of those letters in this House of Sky. Well, you know, I think what's so interesting about the results of our little um, informal survey is the same thing happened. We had a, a symposium on Ivan Doig. Maybe some of you came a few years ago after uh, the archives acquired their paper, their, his papers. And we also did a sort of informal poll about which was which books were people's favorite. And this house of sky, number one. But um, it was pretty widespread. You know, there was just something people related to the books in different ways and they really, um, so it wasn't like he only wrote one great, great book and then nobody read anything else. You know, everybody had other favorites in significant numbers. And his editor said uh, at the time that Whistling Season had actually outsold this House of Sky for a certain period of time. So I think that it's just such a tribute to the quality of his writing that it appeals to so many different folks. Okay, well, let me talk a little bit about one of the important themes, I think, uh, for Ivan. Um, here's an, this is a photo that was taken by a Seattle newspaper in his um, home in uh, Puget Sound. So Ivan's own life and the stories that he wrote about it um, some are autobiographical, some are based on historic characters, and I think a lot of people in Montana have fun trying to guess who some of the, like, wealthy, powerful ranchers might have really been, you know. Um, the last book that I had just, the, one of the books, the book I had not read was Prairie Nocturne, which he, um, in which Ivan had a African-American uh, uh, cowboy who had a fantastic voice and he went on to become a singer. And it was loosely based on Taylor Gordon. Ivan was very um, new Taylor Gordon. He was really interested in his experiences of, as a black man growing up in White Silver Springs. He had interviewed him, but in, the, in, in Ivan's novel, it is completely fiction. I mean, he has this African-American singer character, but his life in the novel does not take the course that Taylor Gordon's life in the book did. So he used um, people he knew or people who he had read about or people who he had met in, um, in his novels, but they were an inspiration for him. He was not trying to, you know, um, somehow shallowly cloak the history of a person who he knew. But one of the things that he is very well known for, and I think very respected for, especially in Montana, is that he wrote about people who, both some who were fixed to the land through ownership, but many people who were fixed through the, to the land through their work on it. And um, one of the things that makes Ivan's own work, his writing, both his memoirs and his novels, is that I, I think so appealing is that they appeal, that they are about ordinary people, they are about working people, and he is determined to make them literary characters, people who deserve respect. It's not that they're all heroes, they have problems, you know, they sometimes make mistakes or do acts of evil, but, um, but he really wanted to, to give dignity to um, what, what he called the lariat proletariat, right? The working class people who worked on the land. And um, I think that that's one of the reasons I liked Ivan's books when I first uh, came to Montana, because I was also studying miners and women who lived in Butte. And I was really interested in their 
work and how they organized their lives and how they dealt with the power of the Anaconda Company. Um, so, he, and he chose characters like his own family who the, you know, several of the doigs of the earlier generations had homesteaded and lost their homesteads. Um, his own nuclear family did not own land and they had to move often season to season in order to find work. And sometimes no matter how hard they worked, they just could not seem to get ahead in the sort of American dream way. And this is not really a very common theme in American literature or even in American history. And I think that part of that reason, you know, as a historian who has thought about this, that it's much harder to trace the lives and try to recreate the experiences of people who traverse the country in agriculture or mining or other extractive industries that are so common to the West. They don't leave many marks upon the land behind them. Um, you know, the fact that people in Ivan's family kept these letters was a treasure trove. Sometimes when people moved, they couldn't, they, you know, they just couldn't carry that stuff with them. And historians tend to use written records. And we have huge sections of the population who, even if they create a written record, it's unlikely to end up in an archive or a library, right? They're not asked for those. They would never think that they would be important enough to put in those places. And so Ivan, you know, through his own experience and then the research that he did, which I'll talk about when I get to the archive, um, he really tried to reclaim the stories of those people. And I have nothing but admiration uh, for him for that work. He respected work, he respected in his, in his family, in um, uh, the people he knew growing up in Montana and in his own process of writing. He once said, work is its own country. And um, which is one of my favorite uh, lines of his. And he know that to do work well, it took a lot of time. And, and that, um, as I, I'll, again, I'll say in a few minutes is how he himself worked as a writer. There's a literature professor at um, University of Montana, Nancy Cook, who has written about Ivan as a labor historian, as someone who has written the history of labor in Montana. And she said, Doig does not simply give his characters occupations as farmers, herders, dam builders, or short order cooks. Instead, he shows them at work. He describes how they complete their tasks and he imbues their labor with dignity and skill involved in a job well done. And if you think about that and you think about some of the books that you like, you know, he talks about how to clear brush in Bucking the Sun. He talks about how to castrate sheep in This House of Sky. I mean, you could sort of use these as a manual of how to do these tasks. Um, and he didn't make, uh, as I said, all of his working people into heroes. Many of them had uh, flaws. But Ivan, um, as one of uh, my colleagues here pointed out, reserved often reserved his scorn uh, for characters who were bosses and who were ran or who were ranch owners um, and who were incompetent, right? He had no use for the incompetent. So people, um, owners who were careless of their livestock, um, who cut corners that made work dangerous for humans and animals, you can tell in his books that he does not have any respect uh, for them. When Ivan turned uh, from ranch work, and just show you a couple of things, this is, um, uh, there are four women up in Dupuyer who have uh, really celebrated Ivan. They created a holiday in the summer on his birthday called Doig Day of Summer. And um, this is, a, there's a sheep herders monument there uh, in the little town with this um, plaque on it. They also, See, I had this other, maybe I already went back and see. Oh, this one. They also um, got a stretch of Highway 89 named the Ivan Doig Memorial Highway. And uh, so it's really fun to go up there. There aren't, uh, one of my 
uh, colleagues took a trip to West, White Sulphur Springs this summer thinking that there would be a lot about Ivan there, but there really isn't. It's more, his life has been more celebrated up in Depuyer. Mary? So, yeah. We've, we have several questions and comments that have come in and I don't, would yeah. you, would you be willing to, you know? Yes, in I, fact, what, the next thing on my paper was stop. <laughs> Do you want, okay. do you need to say something before we stop or is I that? I do not. Okay. Um, I, I think one thing to assure the people who are watching this, Mary, you'll be able to see all these comments there. They'll, they'll, you'll have access to them so that if we don't touch on every single comment that comes in, you will see them. Okay. Um, but um, among the questions that came in, maybe in order, um, one person wants to know um, which of the books did he write about his mother? That is Heart Earth. Okay. It's, okay. A, it's a slim volume. Yeah, Heart Earth. Okay. And um, someone else has asked, uh, they said they've been to White Sulphur Spring and, uh, and Ringling, but um, where else in Montana would you encourage literary pilgrims to visit? <laughs> so I would say for Ivan, go to Dupuyer. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to remember where it was. I, I think it might have been the State Historical Society created a kind of um, literary, I love the phrase, a literary pilgrims tour of Montana. You know, they, they know, they created a story map of where different writers um, lived. And I think if you, um, if you if you Google it and you can't find it, I would contact Martha Cole, K-O-H-L. She works at the Montana Historical Society in the education department, and she would know where you could find that. I'll keep going then. Um, so um, oh, you, you touched on this somewhat, and this is a pretty big question, but could you talk about his writing process and how he utilized Montana places and landscapes in his work. Mm -hmm. Can I hold off on that? Because I wanna show you some material from his archive that speaks to his work process. So if you have a shorter question, maybe we could do that first. Yeah. Karen, do you, do you wanna sure. pick up any or? Sure. Um, so someone also asked a little bit more information about David Laskin. Uh, mm -hmm. He is curious if Ivan Doig had a direct influence on or on what or how Mr. Laskin wrote. Well, um, I'm going to put up at the end of the presentation the link to the Ivan Doig archive, but you could also just Google Ivan, Ivan Doig archive and it will take you right there. And um, uh, one of Ivan's friends made a film about Ivan um, Ivan Doig Among Friends, I think it was called. And he, uh, she, the filmmaker, interviewed David Laskin. And so he talks about that. He talks about their friendship and um, the influence that Ivan had on him. So I would, I think that would be your best source for finding that. So uh, someone uh, shared their favorite passage from Doig oh, and it's um, yeah bottom of page 80 in heart earth and uh, it says but earth and heart don't have much of a membrane between them sometimes decided on grounds as elusive as that single transposable h this matter of citing uh, or sitting ourselves of a place mysteriously insisting itself into us so yeah, that's very lovely. nice. Yeah, yeah. Another person comments about um, how um, he um, taught in a college English department and they offered a writing course for the first year students. And these courses each had a particular theme or focus. And he did a course focused on the theme of fathers and sons. And our central text was Ivan's novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, those are lovely. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's great. Well, let me actually um, 
talk more about his writing process. I see we've still got um, some time left. He was amazingly diligent. I'm just gonna move to the archive for a minute. Um, writing was his job, not a pastime. That's how he always saw it. And, you know, many people ask the question, Ivan, so many of Ivan's books are set in Montana, but why did he leave Montana? Why did he spend the rest of his life in Seattle? And in, in, in an, in, again, in an interview with him, he said uh, that they, they lived um, in Shoreline, a little bit north of uh, downtown Seattle. And he said it was the quietest place he had ever lived. Hmm. And that's what he needed for his work. And, and you know, who knows what other um, reasons there were too. But he set a target every day for how many words he was going to produce. And he did not leave his study until he got those done. I think his background as a journalist, you know, having to write to deadline, churning out um, a, a number of pieces helped him do that. Um, and then he also did not just sort of send a book off to a publisher and then forget about it. He really attended to the business of writing and his editor talked about this. Um, he taught himself about the publishing business. He was a true partner in the production and the sale of his books. So he, you know, he really saw himself um, as a professional writer, not just like a creative writer. This was a business. This was how he was supporting himself and Carol. Um, and so you, you, wouldn't be content to just send off the manuscript. He was very active in the editorial process in you know, wanting to have um, contr some control over the cover, over what independent bookstores would have it. Country Bookshelf here in Bozeman was his favorite independent bookstore in Montana. Um, and he came here many times. And when he himself was asked how he continued to produce so many books, even when he had a terminal illness. He said that he suffered from pathological diligence. So, you know, this was like you got to the desk every day and you did your work and only then could you go and do something else. So I want to talk about the archive because we can see his writing process. Um, when Ivan died, he had already been putting order to his papers. And um, so, uh, Carol Doig, Ivan's widow, sub asked a few universities to submit a proposal for why they should have Ivan's papers. And um, she chose MSU. And I think that uh, not only was it that we were uh, the Montana, I think the only Montana institution that had put in a proposal, but the, library, the dean of the library here and the dean of the College of Letters and Sciences um, really put together a tremendous packet. They asked well-known Western writers and um, people who had known Ivan and me as a historian, a, West, a Western historian, to write letters to Carol about why the archive would be in good hands if it was here and what Ivan had meant to us personally or to, you know, depicting the life of Montana. So she did choose us and um, one of her conditions was that the archive would be completely digitized within a year so that it would be available to anyone in the world to look at it. And this was an amazing uh, amount of work for the librarian, for the library staff, but they did it. And so you can go to the Montana State Library, click, click on search, put in the Ivan Doig archive. It's even easier to just type it into a Google search box. Um, it's organized in these categories, and I'm going to talk about a few of them. His diaries, and as you can see, these are typed, very interesting, note cards, manuscripts, writer's files, and then we have interviews and readings. These are, um, Ivan himself conducted many taped interviews with people, um, and then we even have him reading from his book. So we have that voice. And then there's uh, photographs and then these little pocket notebooks. So let me talk about a few things. This is a sample page from one of his manuscripts. And you can see how, um, you know, someone has edited it. He has responded to that. In that corner, you can see STET, which in 
proofread proofreading language means leave it alone. I like it the way it is. Um, and uh, he even gives directions at certain points for how he wants it um, to appear on the page. So he's giving marks for printers. He kept, he Ivan typed all of his manuscripts on a typewriter. He did switch to computers late in life, but um, we, also have um, in the memorabilia collection some of his typewriters and so um, he typed several drafts so you can if you are a literary historian or trying to understand how a writer um, worked you can see how he changes a text from draft to draft okay <clears throat> Ivan was famous for these little pocket notebooks. He, um, I don't know how old or young he was when he started carrying them, but he would carry these little notebooks wherever he went and he would just jot down notes to himself. Sometimes they would be an idea, like if you can read this, it says, trying to write beyond myself, thinking my guts out, um, what's at stake? And uh, down below a phrase, dense fools. So Carol talks about Ivan as being an inveterate eavesdropper. They would be in a cafe. And if he heard somebody, you know, use a, a really great phrase, out would come the notebook and he would write that down. And, um, and he was passionate about language. He just loved language and he loved vernacular language. So the, the language of ordinary people. So these notebooks are like a little window into um, what caught his ear in many ways, as well as sometimes what he's thinking. And then he has these note cards and um, we have hundreds of these, they're five by eight inches. And they contained, uh, they contained also typed and handwritten words, sentences, phrases, character traits when he's trying to develop a character um, in one of his novels, uh, plots, descriptions of landscape, um, these ideas that were incorporated into his work. So these are notes for Bucking the Sun. And I chose this one because it again has these details about work. Um, the story of him and another carpenter laying the floor, it's tongue and groove flooring, you know, um, why, working while he and another carpenter hammered. And then this um, phrase at the end that establishing himself into Fort Peck scene in this blinding night of work, a legendary night of work. Um, and he would take some of these cards at times and paste them into pages of the manuscript as a reminder of what he wanted to include or you know sometimes they just had a lot of different language that he could use in several books um, so kind of shuffle them around to see where they would fit most and then I think is that um, manuscripts note cards oh I had a slide yes I wanted to talk about this this is um, a page from his diary so I have this, I've seen Ivan's study in um, Puget Sound. He, I just can't even imagine how much time he spent at the typewriter because not only did he type his manuscripts and those note cards, he typed his own personal diary. In later years, he got very interested in gardening. And so he started keeping a separate garden diary. When he um, was diagnosed, he kept the a diary that was the journey of his illness. And he wanted that to be made public. And we have heard from people who have had multiple myeloma, who have read some of Ivan's diaries and have felt it, found it very helpful. He was always quite interested in his and other people's health. So I'm just gonna read, um, in case you, you can't read this, two little sections from this. And it's dated January 4th, 1979. So this is, shortly after this House of Sky uh, came out. He says, and just listen to this language. He said, in what has been a rather staggery start to the year, today's news is damned firming. Rhoda called to say that the, this Sunday's New York Times will carry a favorable review of Sky, meaning this House of Sky, by Wright Morris. She said he picks up an angle no one else has, the role of women in the West. 
She also said the final sales figure for 78, meaning 1978, is 15,800. And then as the entry goes on, he talks about other things in the week. And then at the bottom, he says C, meaning Carol, the initial C, seems pleased with her first three days of class, coming home cheerful all the time. So, you know, there's, you can read any day that might have stuff about his writing process, something about the business of his books, something about his health, something about his garden, something about Carol. Um, they're just really fascinating. And then um, th this was, a, he wrote each week, so he didn't always write every day. January 11th, on a longer entry, he includes a part about having to think about income taxes. And he said, with the $9,000 advance check, I've already made about as much as I've ever made in any year of my life. And I used one of those cool um, currency converters and $9,000 in 1979 would have been about $31,000 today. So this, you know, was really a great thing to celebrate. Um, I just, I'm going to end so we can have some more questions. And I just want to show you, um, I'm not thanking myself. I'm just giving you my email in case you want to get in touch. Jan Zuha is the outreach librarian at the university. She probably knows more about Ivan Doig and his books than anybody. She has um, hosted several book clubs uh, about his books. And so to kind of conclude with the border theme, all you have to do is break a digital border to you know, immerse yourself in Ivan Doig's archive, or you are more than welcome to make an appointment and come over and see the physical Ivan Doig archive. You can, you know, request to see one of his manuscripts. You can request to see one of his typewriters. You just need to give the archivist a little advance notice. So I, I guess I would say at the end, I was introduced, as I told Karen, to um, Ivan Doig the year I came to Montana. I came to Montana in December. December of 1979. And at that time, this House of Sky was only a year old. So in many ways, it was my introduction to Montana. I came to Butte. I uh, grew up in Massachusetts. I was very comfortable in Butte. As I said to people, I know how to talk Irish Catholic. Um, it was, a, you know, ethnic working class city, the kind of place that I came from. But I sure as heck did not understand anything about rural Montana. And so Ivan Doig was my entry into that world. And I've always admired him as a writer. But I have to say that when we got this tremendous gift from Carol of his archives, and, and I myself have only dipped into different parts of it, um, I am so much more appreciative of him as a writer, as a true wordsmith right? A wordsmith, a person who makes words, because he did, he literally did that. He would turn nouns into verbs. He would um, just, and he edited himself pr just profoundly until he got the right poetry to his language. And so to be able to see the inner workings of that through his archive is uh, such a privilege. So I'm very grateful to Ivan, to Carol, and I'm very grateful to you for inviting me to talk with you this evening. Well, Mary, Thank we've you, Mary. enjoyed, yes, we've enjoyed the program so much. Um, Diane, I'll jump in with one question about um, Ivan's sense of humor. Uh, someone noticed, noted his good humor in Last Bus to Wisdom and English Creek and uh, wonders if he had a good sense of humor in real life. Yeah, I, I, you know, I only knew Ivan a little bit. I met him a few times here in Bozeman when he was here to sign books at the Country Bookshelf. And in fact, we were, the last time I talked to Ivan was at the memorial service for a mutual friend of us, a friend of ours in Helena. But yeah, he, you know, he, he did. He had a wry sense of humor. He loved wordplay, you know, because of his love of language. He was very good company. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to finish up um, a comment that came in earlier. I didn't quite finish it, but the person who was talking about how he taught um, the theme of focusing on fathers and sons and 
the novel that they that they that he taught was English Creek, and it was his favorite work, and it was really popular with the students. Uh, so he mentioned that that was done at a college in the Midwest. He wanted to finish that thought, and then another person um, referencing when you were talking about um, a black family in um, White Sulphur Springs said, note that there is a new article on Anna uh, Gordon family, Anna Gordon's quest for equality, family, labor, mm -hmm. and black community in White Sulphur Springs, 1883 through 1924 in the autumn 2021 of Montana, the magazine of Western history. Mm -hmm. So that's a great reference. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, thank you very much. There's an interesting comment about someone um, regarding when Ivan Doig came to the University of Wyoming in the early 1980s, hosted by the American Studies Department. Um, she says that when someone introduced him to a student who was from a Wyoming sheep ranch, he took this young man aside and talked with him alone for about 20 minutes. It was so clear he valued this young man and wanted, wanted to share time with him. It was a real testament to his dedication to that way of life and to the people who still lived it. Mm -hmm. It was deeply impressive to me. This young man was the most important person in that audience to Doig, and I'm certain that student never forgot that special experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lovely story. And we, I have a similar story, a, a, a person who is a non-traditional, meaning older than normal, student, a graduate student, she, um, she was related actually to uh, Gertie Chadwick, the Chadwick, the woman with whom Ivan um, boarded when he was in high school. And she, so she knew of Ivan, she didn't really, I think, know him personally, but at one point when she was trying to decide what to do, whether she wanted to write or go on to graduate school, she wrote to him and he wrote her a lovely letter. And, you know, David Laskin has, and Carol have talked about, he was very generous to people who wrote to him for advice or even asking if he, if they would read, if he would read a draft for them. So he was um, the best of colleagues in that kind of way. Yeah. Here's another nice um, reference. This person um, said, you know, whistling season is one of my favorites. I'm a rancher's and farmer's daughter, fourth generation from Scobie, attended Montana State University. My cousin was a librarian at MSU when Mr. Doig's collection arrived, and she was a part of the team to digitize it. She now, this person now lives on the Hood Canal in Washington State in Seabeck, Washington, and their Seabeck Elementary School which started in 1847 and the staff and parents read Whistling Season uh, as a group in the final year of Seabeck Elementary just before it closed in 2005. And the person says that they, she could so relate to this treasured story. And she just says, thank you, Mary. I love the presentation, multiple exclamation marks. And she'll be reading a few others that she hasn't yet read. So um, oh, okay. there's a lot of gratitude in the comments that you'll see when you have a chance to read them. Well, thank you. And whistling season is one of my favorites too. So I appreciate that. Shall we call it a night, people? Whoops, Karen is muted. Sorry. I know she okay. Yes, I, I do have another question for you, if that's okay, Mary. Sure. Okay. Do we know any writers Doig cited as influences or as inspiration for focusing on the experiences of working people in his writing? That's a really good question. I, I don't know enough about that. He, he, was, um, he was very influenced by Wallace Stegner. And if you know Wallace Stegner's work, it meant it too, um, his relationship with his father, it, there's part of this kind of Western itinerant life and his book Wolf Willow is also somewhat of a memoir of growing up in a Western landscape. But that's a really great question and I'm going to ask Carol. So if you leave, if when I see the comments, I'll see if I can follow up on that. I'd like to great. know myself. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else we want to ask, Diane, do you think? Well, maybe just one one more and we will cut it off. <laughs> and this uh, person asks if Ivan Doig ever worked with Nelson Bentley at the University of Washington. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, it's Mary. It's always good to end a question when you ask the speaker and she doesn't know the answer. <laughs> You've, uh, you've given us so much in this presentation, not only great information, but also I think for many of us just sparked a, a renewed interest to um, seek out more, um, read or reread um, his books. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Yes, thank you. We sure appreciate it, Mary. Have a wonderful okay. evening and thank, thank you to all of our viewers. Good okay. night. Until next week, good night. Good night.